Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I am going to be going over the uh, nine game early slate here on uh, Saturday, May 20. Um, a lot of arms here that we can consider getting to, uh, fewer offenses necessarily because there are a lot of arms, right? Um, we do have projections and ownership early looks loaded to the site uh, over here for DK. Um, and as we can see up here at the top, we got a couple of expensive guys that we might want to get to. Maybe a game that we could be able to uh, cross off in this Mets-Cleveland. Uh, they got some range shenanigans, so we might be able to uh, to get off of that. But you got uh, Logan Webb against Miami. And I think he kind of warrants his price tag, to be quite honest. He's been very good, very consistent. And the ownership kind of following. Uh, he's projecting at the top here so far. But everybody pretty much in the same range. You're getting about uh, two, two to three point delta or so between all of these guys. Um, everybody above 9,000 basically is pretty much equal. Um, so we're going to have to kind of split some hairs in how we decide who we want to play. Uh, usually the first hair we look to split is the ownership, right? Who's coming in too popular for for their matchup or, or their price tag or, or, you know, just kind of whatever. Um, and I think there might be an exploitable spot or two there. Uh, like I said, we could probably ignore the Tanner Bybee in a bad spot against the Mets. And, um, you know, they got rain, right? Uh, John Gray down here in the mid-range, he's going to pop as probably the most popular arm. He gets the Rockies uh, against his old team. we got a lot of that going on today, uh, guys against their old teams. Um, he's going to pop, and he'll be, you know, I think price tag-wise, uh, at least for his arsenal, I mean, we'll get into it. Um, this looks fine, but matchup maybe not so much. Uh, so, I don't know. So, everybody else, I don't you don't really want to play any of these guys, and... You know, the models don't want to play any of them either. Um, there's a couple down here that are kind of popping a little bit. Luke Weaver in a weird spot, popping for 13 points against Yankees. I don't know about that. Yankees, are you're, they're going to see 15% aggregate ownership today. They'll be very popular. Um, and also Braxton Garrett against a heavily uh, platoon-heavy Giants team over here. He's not been very good. So uh, kind of curious there. you got a couple of guys down here in the cheaper range, uh, Pat, Patty Corbin, who's been far better this season, starting to figure this out a little bit. He's a 58. I think you can play him probably. Uh, Brandon Fott as well. He gets Pittsburgh at 5,400. Uh, I think he is in play as well. So that said, uh, we do have ownership and, and projections loaded. This will change because we've still got a lot of noise coming in, um, you know, as is n normal uh, when we get early slates takes a little while for some of the models to wake up so um let's just get into it here and we'll start with arizona and pittsburgh brandon fought as we mentioned 5400 i think you'd play this if you get to an expensive stack uh or a very popular combination elsewhere then i think this is in play the the price tag is is in play um the like the upside for him is there. He's a very high upside prospect. This is their prize gem in the Arizona system here. Um, and even though he kind of struggled out of the gate in his first couple of starts, got beat up pretty good, he was fine and better in his last start. Uh, went, uh, let's see here. I had it up. Um, where is he? Yeah, went a full five innings, did walk three, so spraying it a little bit still, uh, and struck out five, just gave up one run against the Giants, who we'll get to in a minute. Um, so he was much better. It did only pop him, because he didn't get a win out of it, for 17 DK points. At 5,400, that's usually fine uh, at just 17. If he could squeeze a win out of it, then that puts him north of 20, and you're really in business. Uh, if you can nail everything else of course so i think this is in play i think he has upside 420 and this is kind of a a fishy matchup though however against pirates um they may have broken out yesterday they put up a real crooked number against zach gallon who really got torn apart uh he was expensive he was only on the turbo slate this game was and uh they got to him a little bit and we, they kind of showed 
a little bit of their uh, early season uh, prowess, so to speak, and, and really took him apart. He didn't have his control. He, he was spraying it all over the place. But So Gallon was bad. It wasn't that necessarily the Pirates were good, but um, that's really kind of all they needed was somebody to be bad uh, to allow their offense to get off Schneid a little bit. And I think they did. Um, in aggregate, just kind of an average offense here, of course, still, but uh, very dangerous uh, if all of these guys start hitting again, as we saw at the early part of the season. Kutch, they've been leading off, um, and they've had to drop Cabrian Hayes down uh, against righties. His upside is just not there. He just hits too many ground balls and uh, strikes out a good bit uh, against the right side, and Kutch's not going to do that. Uh, Brian Reynolds still expensive at the top 59. I'm not sure I want to go after Fod here, um, especially with Reynolds at that price tag. But you can always play Jack Sawinski, 4100. He's in the middle of the lineup and he's still hitting the baseball exceptionally hard. You know, top 20 in baseball and, and average exit velo, I believe. Um, so if you want to get to a couple of short stacks, yeah, maybe like a Jiwon Bay or something, uh, who has some speed. Um, Carlos Santana, he's going to walk a lot, so I'm, he's not. Generally not my favorite DFS play. So the Pirates are kind of hard to stack a little bit. Uh, so I'd probably prefer to stay off of that, I think. Um, they're going to be totally off the board here. So if you want to get there, I I, I mean, nobody's going to be playing it. it. It's totally fine, and it's a super contrarian stack. If you want to go after a young arm that's shown some vulnerabilities here so far. Can't take anything out of the value metrics, of course. But he is a four-seamer slider, curveball change guy. He's going to try and stay down in the strike zone with the change into curveball. But that hasn't quite materialized just yet. And it's translating to a an 045 ground ball to fly ball here in aggregate. Uh, just 65 hitters, so super noisy here. Uh, as you can see, he's not going to give up 4.3 homers per nine um, longer term. Having a little bit of trouble throwing strikes to the left side, is he, so far, and the strikeout stuff really hasn't been there just yet. Um, but he is in play, and like I said, he's got upside for 22, 25 points or something in this particular matchup. But I think you could play some Pirates pieces as well. I, not my favorite stack here. Um, pretty low upside. This is a, still a huge ballpark um, over here at PNC in Pittsburgh. So... Not my favorite, and price adjusted, I think I'd rather get to Fott at 54 if he need it. I am not sure we're going to need it. There's a lot of arms up top that we can really mix and match with, and there's plenty of other cheap teams that you can get to. You don't, I don't think you'd need this Pirates value uh, and try to take shorts on a pretty high upside arm in general, but uh, he's undoubtedly been struggling a little bit. We'll see if he's starting to figure it out. Uh, I think it's in play at 5,400. Mitch Keller on the mound, I really love this, man. Um, I, I could spend just hours drooling over Mitch Keller's fastball arsenal here. Uh, it, it's so, so, so good, man. Um, he's incredibly balanced. He's doing it to both sides of the plate. He's staying off of the two-seamer to lefties, throwing more of the cutter. Uh, but he's still showing it to them. And he's, he's balanced there. Four-seamer has been incredible value as well. He's lacking... In the the realized value with the slider, but this is effectively break even because he's getting so much value out of the the fastball the fastball and establishing with these three pitches here. It's just absolutely incredible the full transformation for him. And this is their ace. Um, he's every bit an ace now for him. And if he can make a couple of adjustments in the arsenal, stop throwing the two seamer as much to lefties. And, and throw it a little bit more to the righties. That'll help him neutralize a bit more of this production and the average that he's he's giving up to the right side and keep him a little bit more down in the strike zone. Uh, everything here is fantastic. The strikeout stuff is there. The whiffs are there. The two-seamer is just a, a, an unbelievably good pitch. I wish he'd throw it more to the right side. He's throwing it at about 30% to righties. But I, I wish he'd throw it like you know a good 40 or even 50 percent um in any case that would keep him down in the strike zone a little bit more to the righties when he gets a little bit more comfortable with this slider here with such good cutter value right now uh the value on this slider should come up over a larger sample and that'll give him some more whiffs even 
than he's already realizing with a 28% K rate against the right side of the plate. Curveball's been fantastic as a whiff pitch as well to both sides. Um, everything is just, it, it's it's excellent here. The changeup is still a work in progress. If he can develop out the change, get more confidence in, in the slider and the change here to be throwing these in any count, then... Uh, this will make him. This will give him a top five, maybe even a top three aggregate arsenal in baseball. It's a, a total 180 and transformation for Mitch Keller here. And frankly, I think he's underpriced at 9,300. I'd much rather play him than a guy than we will get to uh, here shortly, who's coming in far more popular. Even though he gets a very difficult matchup over here against D-backs. 9% walk rate, their patient team over here, 19% strikeout rate in aggregate against righties, 33% hard, a few ground balls here, but they're going to get it on the line as well, so that's okay. Strong homer to fly ball rate, and they're hitting for a good bit of power. This is a very balanced offense against right-handed pitching over here. Uh, so it, it does make sense that the models are, are projecting some below average ownership than where he should be given this arsenal. Uh, everything here is just fantastic. I'd like to see a little bit more chase out of him, and that would come with a slider and a changeup when he develops those. But as of right now, he doesn't necessarily need it because the fastball command and and equity he's eking out of these three pitches uh, and the curveball as well, it's just top tier. So um, Keller is excellent, and I would really like to get a lot of him today. Uh, not sure if I'm going to get a full... 40 or 50 percent necessarily because you know this is still a bad matchup um but i think this is a a really good spot to pivot in the upper range uh at a similar price tag to a lot of the other guys and and get a good bit of, of mitch keller i think this is i'm i'm fairly confident that this arsenal change here throwing more of this two seamer and the cutter is totally real. The walk problem is completely gone. He's on the barrel a little bit, um, but th this is okay when he's got this kind of swing and miss and he stays down in the strike zone to the left side of the plate. Like I said, the only worry here is the fly ball rate, the ground ball to fly ball ratio, that is, and the line drives to the right side. So if he can really feel this slider and throw it down in the strike zone, um, this will be a 35% strikeout rate plus to the right side. And, uh, and he would be an 11 K pitcher every single day, like just top tier. Uh, it's all fantastic from Keller's pitching to a little bit too much contact at the moment. So I wish he developed some of this, some more swing and miss, but the fastballs are just so good that, uh, so much contact is, it's just been excellent for him. So I really want to get to a good bit of Mitch Keller here. I'm very excited to play him. Um, I could, like I said, I could go on for hours about the arsenal here. It's just fantastic. Um, so I think both pitchers are in, are in play here, really kind of off of offense for the most part. I, I do like Sawinski, and I love playing Corbin Carroll in general against everybody, but I'm not sure I want to play him at 56 uh, against Keller here today, nor do I want to play Josh Rojas, Cattell Marte. Um, you want to play Christian Walker because of the fly ball rate? Yeah, sure, okay, if you're homer hunting. But again, I think there's plenty of other teams that we could get to rather than the D-backs targeting a very high upside arm here. Uh, I would not be surprised, and I'm kind of counting on it, if Mitch Keller really takes apart this offense uh, and suppresses them pretty good. So really excited to play a, a good bit of pitching here, mostly Keller, but some fought as well at a very playable price tag. Okay, Miami and the Giants. Braxton Garrett on the mound. Um, you know, like I said, I'm confused why his projection is kind of so high here. Everything in this arsenal is is pretty bad to be quite honest um we still got a shortage sample on him but 165 hitters are starting to converge a little bit with the pitch values and yeah it's, it's definitely noisy and i was excited coming into this season to play a lot of Bra a, a lot of braxton garrett because i was hoping that he had really figured out the power to the power problems that is uh to the opposite side of the plate but look at these numbers 342 realized average 402 woba with a 233 iso it's not because he's walking people this is all contact and it's very hard contact fully on the barrel at an 11 percent clip 43 percent hard contact to the right side with a sub 10 percent soft contact rate a lot of line drives here um some ground balls yeah but 
This is very worrisome with a, a, con a hard contact rate north of 40%. I don't, uh, I don't want to deal with this. Um, now, the Giants are going to come in pretty off the board, I think. They're moving up the board a little bit in, in the aggregate ownership from the models as we're getting more updates to come in here in the early morning. But uh, I don't want to deal with this at all, I don't think. I think this median projection is probably a bit aggressive, to be quite honest. Uh, I don't like the two-seamer that he throws a majority of the time to the right side of the plate. The change has been equitable, but if the, I mean, we're only talking a four and five mile an hour velo delta on the change up to these fastballs here with the four seamer sinker cutter, that's not enough. You need at least seven miles an hour of velo change on the change up. Otherwise, it's just a fourth fastball and, and it's just not equitable enough. Um, this, this. These values here are, are super noisy. So either the value on the fastball is going to come up or the changeup value is going to come down, at which point he'd be giving up outs to the field on literally every single pitch that he's throwing. So I'm not interested in this really at all here against the Giants. I know the Giants are bad against left-handed pitching. Um, 86 WRC plus 27% aggregate K rate with a buck 30 ISO and a 26% hard contact. Um, a lot of ground balls, a lot of infield fly balls. So I, I, I get that, but I think this is an attackable spot for a couple of these Giants because they're very cheap. It, notably, Wilmer Flores, he's got a very high fly ball rate, matches up very well, makes a, a lot of hard contact against lefties. He's 2,600, and they'll likely have him in the two-hole, first and third base eligible. This is one of the better value plays of the day, in my estimation. Mitch Haniger, also super cheap with a high fly ball rate, makes a lot of hard, hard contact, hits for a lot of line drives, He's 3,200. He'll likely be in the three. J.D. Davis hits a few more ground balls, but he's got a, a boatload of pop from the right side as well. Casey Schmidt has been great. Uh, Patrick Bailey behind the plate made his debut last night. He might actually start and get some ABs today. And Tyro at the top. He's been probably their most consistent hitter all season so far. Um, so I think getting to some of the Giants here, targeting Braxton Garrett is okay. He's throwing a lot of strikes. And he's going to throw it over the plate and make you hit it. The swing and miss stuff is there a little bit to the left side, but this is a short sample here. And he's a lefty. He'll still have fine swing and miss stuff against same-handed hitters. But so far, the fastball mix is not encouraging for him this season. And he's given up a lot of power here. Uh, so much hard contact. 210 X ISO is way, way high with a 311 XBA. Uh, no, thank you. I'm not dealing with any of this. And the rest of the field's really not either. So um, he's at a playable 6,300 price tag for him, but I think this is not a very good spot against some of these righties over here. They profile batted ball-wise pretty well, so I'd like to get to some Giants if I can. Uh, Logan Webb on the mound for them, 10-6. I think this is okay. He's been really, really good this season. 70% strike one rate is elite. Look at the chase here at 36%. This is elite tier. Uh, it doesn't walk anybody. High ground ball rate, as we know from Logan Webb. It's still at 2.4 in aggregate to both sides of the plate, really. There's no power. They'll hit for some average, but, like, everybody's going one for four against him. So I'm fine with this. And there's hard contact north of 30%, but I don't really care at this figure when he's getting so many ground balls. None of it's in the air. He's not walking anybody. And he's still got a little bit of swing and miss, about average to the lefties, which is fine. Changeup's been very, very equitable so far. Uh, but he's still got it against the right side as well, staying down in the strike zone so heavily. So um, staying off of the barrel here, and all of this looks good. At 10-6, I'd like a little bit more out of the raw swinging strike category that we're getting, but... He's got a full 20% called strike rate here, and that pushes the full CSW over 30%, and that's really the threshold that we look for for elite starting pitchers. I think this is fine, and this projection, it's probably a little high. Uh, as I haven't mentioned it in a while, but I start to balk at a medium projection over 20 points. Uh, but I think this is a fine spot because the Marlins are just as bad as the Giants have been against left-handed pitching, um, against right-handed pitching. So... 84 WRC plus for them, not walking, striking out at a full 24% clip. 32.5% hard, yeah, fine, but they're making a buck, or putting most of this on the ground in making that uh, hard contact. Really no soft contact here, so that's kind of encouraging from the Marlins at least, but uh, a lot of that is due to 
uh, Jazz Chisholm, who is out. So, um, you know, most of this average here is actually coming from Luis Arise, who's just going to hit 450 the entire season or something. But they don't hit for any power in aggregate, even though they've got a couple of guys like a, a Georgie Soler and a Brian De La Cruz that can hit it over the wall. Everybody else is just contact hitter, and they don't make all that much contact, to be quite honest, as you mentioned, with a 24% aggregate K rate. So I think this is fine to play some Logan Webb. He's expensive and that's really what's going to make it so difficult because there's plenty of arms here that we can get to at the top. 33% ownership is is coming in so high because of the matchup. So I think at this particular price tab and kind of a fishy high medium projection, I think it's okay to get off of some of this at this particular ownership figure if you want to pivot down and make things a little bit cheaper. I think that's fine. But Totally fading a Logan Webb here in this spot, I think, is probably not the the approach that I'm going to take, certainly, uh, and probably not the best idea. I think it's a pretty decent spot for the Giants here. Um, you know, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense why Braxton Garrett's popping so hard in the projection when, it, like, the Giants are laying whatever eight and a half to five into betting markets here, uh, so they're pretty large favorites at a dollar seventy-five. Um, I don't think there's really any value on the Marlins here. So I like mostly the Giants, and including some of their offense. This is a day game in San Francisco, and there's about a 12, 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing out to dead center and left center. So, yeah, sign me up. Okay, Colorado and Texas. Kyle Freeland on the mound, 6,800. He's been very good this season, considering that he didn't throw it past anybody um, and that he pitches at Coors Field a lot of the time. He's still giving up pop to the right side, 211 ISO, 323 WOBA, which is actually a pretty good number, 250 average, pretty damn good number. So he gives up some some power here, but a lot of it is because he plays a course field. The hard contact woes are still there against righties for Kyle Freeland, um, and the fly balls are a concern. So that's how we're going to really want to attack Kyle Freeland when we go after him. But I'm not sure I really want to. I think this could be a spot today, despite the fact that he pitches to 83% contact and doesn't have a lot of whiffs, 8% swinging strike rate, and a 19% aggregate K rate. I think we could probably come off of Texas a little bit here today. Uh, he's been very good. I don't want to play Kyle Freeland. Don't get me wrong. And you can absolutely stack against him because when he's bad, he floats this two-seamer and he floats it so much that it just goes over the wall. So, like... When he's bad, he can be really, really bad because the sinker gets bad, and then the changeup is bad, and then he doesn't have anything uh, because the slider is not getting him any any real whiffs to the right side of the plate. Uh, he's not burying this you know, down and back foot like he'd really like to to get swing and miss. So if the fastball and, and the off speed are bad there, he's not getting enough value out of the slider to... Uh, really suppress a lot of the contact. So that's when the baseball starts flying against him. So um, it's okay. This is a very high upside offense with the Texas Rangers against lefties, of course. They create 123 WRC plus here. They walk a lot. They don't strike out a lot. They don't hit for as much power, but this this hard contact rate is one of the higher numbers split adjusted in baseball in aggregate for a team, and they hit it in the air. Not as many line drives, so it's not super encouraging there, but they don't pop anything up. So when they hit it in the air, it's hard, and it goes over the fence. So that's really, really encouraging. And I think in aggregate, eventually, the ISO number is going to come up as we get deeper into the season here. So this is a very dangerous matchup for Kyle, and I think he's overpriced a little bit for the particular matchup. But it does kind of take me off if he can find a little bit of value out of the slider. He could survive for a full six and even seven innings here. He can run deep into games. We see that in aggregate, on average here, he's going a full five and two-thirds per start this season. That's very encouraging for a, a starting pitcher for the Rockies, to be quite honest. So I don't think you have to chase Texas. They're going to be popular, of course, because Kyle always gets action against him. Uh, and I think it's fine. Don't get me wrong. Because they did just get their best hitter back, and Corey Seager. He's fine against lefties, and he's got a lot of experience against Kyle Freeland. He's seen him plenty. And you can still play a Marcus Semien at 54, or an Adelise Garcia at 5,000 flat. You can play Nate Lowe. His lefty's fine. Josh Young, 47, not my favorite. But uh, a little bit better contact matchup today. Um, 
for him. Not that it was a bad contact matchup for him yesterday against Carl Kaufman or anything, but Jonah Heim, we like him from the right side of the plate a little bit more. Uh, he's probably a bit more playable today than he was yesterday, for example. Um, so I think Texas is still fine, and they're still at a, a playable stack, hoping that Kyle Freeland just gets bludgeoned here. But he's been good enough that I think you could get off of some of that if you want to and and go elsewhere because they're, they're still going to be owned a little bit here. Uh, John Gray on the mound for the Rangers, 8,300 for him. Uh, like I mentioned at the outset, he's going to be popular, and he's very playable down here uh, at this price tag. I think he's probably underpriced given how much value he's getting out of the slider this season. Um, this is his money-making pitch. And when he has this slider biting, it's good against lefties, it's good against righties, and it makes him very difficult to hit. Now, he's been underpriced in really his last two outings. Uh, he was, what, 77 two starts ago against Seattle. He was fantastic. 68 in his last start against Oakland, also pretty damn good. Went full seven and eight innings in each of those outings. And the strikeout stuff wasn't necessarily there against Oakland, but it was absolutely there against Seattle when he struck out eight in the, in the seven. So uh, it's there for him. But he's struggling still with the curveball and struggling with fastball command. That's really always the problem with John Gray. If he can't, if he's losing it here on the four seamer and not spotting it, then the changeup is bad, and then he just starts spiking the slider and he starts walking people and and pitching to way too much contact. So um, the last couple of starts have been very encouraging for him. He's back up to 8,300 now. I think that's it's fine. It's probably about where he should be, and. The projection and ownership here make make sense. Um, this is fine if you want to if you want to play narrative for the guy against his old team. Go ahead. But if you also want to play a couple of pieces on the other side, they know this guy, <laughs> right? And they let him go uh, for a reason. So keep that in mind when we're playing starting pitchers against our old team. Um, 83 WRC plus though for the Rockies against righties, 22.5% K rate. So they're a little stickier. This isn't the same Rockies that on the road that we have targeted in the last several seasons. They're still going to be bad, right? Don't get me wrong. And they're still going to have very low upside because they're not hitting baseball over the wall, which is a 143 ISO. Very low aggregate upside here because they don't create. But they are making more contact, hitting for a full 261 average. This is not the worst number in baseball as it has been in the last couple of seasons. So they don't pop the ball up, and they hit it on a line here, and they make north of 31% aggregate hard contact. This is a different Rockies lineup. They got a new hitting coach over here, and they got some of these young kids. Michael Tolia, a, a Zeke Tovar, um, and and a guy like a Brent Doyle, for example. Um Elias Diaz has been, is not a young kid, but he's been excellent behind the plate for them. Jerry Profar starting to come into his own and get a little bit more comfortable as well. They still have Charlie Blackman at the at the top of the lineup. He's kind of washed anymore, but uh, he's at a playable 4,600. If you want to play some of these lefties over here, that's really always been the problem with John Gray. He's getting good value out of the changeup so far this season, but you can play a Ryan McMahon. He's really starting to see the baseball over there as well, and as I mentioned, LSD has been fantastic behind the plate. Chris Bryant has been their best all-around hitter all season, uh, and and he's at a playable, although kind of expensive price tag. So if you want to play a couple of these lefty pieces from the Rockies to get off of some of this John Gray ownership, I think that's okay too. Probably not going to go out of my way to do it, but um, you know I like a Michael Tolia, for example, 2,900. He's got a lot of pop from both sides. Harold Castro's been fantastic, to be quite honest. And they'll probably have him in at second base at 2,600. So if you need cheap pieces like that, you can go after some John Gray. You can also play some John Gray here. Um, it's not my personal favorite, though. I, I think it's okay. I'll still have some. But uh, I think you can get off of some of this because I'm still worried about fastball command. Uh, I watched a lot of John Gray when he played for the Rockies. Because I was always waiting for him to just be an elite top tier arm, and he never quite got there. Um, so it it's there for him, but he's still a little bit susceptible. So I think you can play kind of both sides here. Uh, it takes me off of Texas a little bit because Freeland's been so good. Not that I want to play him, but um, interesting game here. Really kind of a a, a cool one, I think. Uh, should be a good baseball game to watch. In any case, let's move on to the Cubs and the Phillies. I don't want to play Tyon here against the Phillies. Uh, the 
the suppression against lefties so far this season has been really, really bad. It's a very short sample and just 52 hitters, but a 326 average allowed is a big number. 239 ISO is a big number with just a 19% K rate. That's a small number. He's walking 11.5% of them with a lot of fly balls and 45% hard contact here. He's throwing so many strikes that it's just right over the damn plate. A full 12% barrel rate here. His last three starts having come off the DL after taking a month off have not been good at all. And I'm not going to start playing him at basically the same price tag here against the Phillies. I'm not sure there's all that much upside. Not getting any value really out of the four-seamer cutter combination here. Sure, he's getting some value out of the two-seamer, but if this two-seamer is on the downside of the variance at all, this baseball's going to float, and this is a day game in Philly in a small ballpark. No thank you. Uh, they got a lot of lefties over here. Bryce Harper, Kyle Schwarber, Bryson Stott, Brandon Marsh. All notable and very playable at their respective price tags. Stott at 44. I think this is fine at um, at second base leading off. You can play Harper, of course. He's 61, but, like, whatever. Uh, he's going to be half the ownership Aaron Judge, who we'll get to later. Kyle Schwarber, 49 now. You can play this as well. Um, so I think this is a fine little lefty stack if you want to get there. You can also play a couple of these righties and mix them in. Trey Turner's going to strike out a little bit in this matchup, I think, but he'll still hit for some average. Full 273 average allowed against Tyon to the right side here. So the expected metrics, we could take a little bit more out of those since the sample is still pretty small. 279 XBA with a 350X Woba and a 206X ISO with some hard contact, notably to the left side here. I think you can go after this. A lot of fly balls so far from Tyon. Uh, I'm not doing with dealing with this at, at 7,200 against the Phillies. I, li I like the Phillies here a little bit. Um, Aaron Nola on the mound here. He's getting a lot of ownership. And I don't really think it's warranted, to be quite honest. 9,200, the price tag is fine for Nola, but I think the median projection is way too high. And mostly it's because he's got a 19% aggregate strikeout rate this season. He's not throwing near as many first pitch strikes as he has in the past. He was upwards of 68 and, and 70 percent last season. He's down to 60. This is way, way out of character for Aaron Nola. The chase is totally gone. The curveball value for which Aaron Nola has been known his entire career is totally evaporated. And he's he's throwing a league average curveball here. Like Jameson Tyon's curveball is better, five times better, as a matter of fact than Aaron Nola's has been this season. So, um, yeah, it's not a direct comparison, but you kind of get what I'm saying here. Ten Sub-10% 10 swinging strike rate, 19% aggregate K rate, just a 61% strike one. These This strike one and, and the K rate and aggregate are about eight ticks, a full 8% lower than they were last season for Nola. So I think something is terribly off with him. And I'm not going to deal with this at 40% ownership. I think this number is way too high, given the other arms, very high upside arms we have on the day. And I'm getting same the same sort of vibe I got from Blake Snell yesterday. Um, I, and I think this ownership is way too high, and I don't think the arsenal is really there. Now, do I trust Aaron Nola a hell of a lot more than I trust Blake Snell? Yeah, of course. Don't get me wrong there. Because uh, he's not going to walk anybody, Nola. But... I, I don't know. This this looks pretty fishy to me. And he may make me look like an idiot because this is still Aaron Nola. It's in the tank for him somewhere. And if he's got good four-seamer command here, throwing strike one, and really feeling the curveball, then he could absolutely pick through the Cubs. But do I really want to go after them with a guy that's got you know just a 20% aggregate K rate right now? No, I don't. To be quite honest, 107 WRC plus, 10% walk rate and a 22% strikeout rate against righties this season. Buck 56 ISO is you know underwhelming, of course, but the Woe was fine to 330, 28% hard contact, a little underwhelming as well, and some ground balls here. So I don't want to go out of my way to stack against Nola, but you can get a hell of a lot of leverage stacking against him when he's not striking anybody out. He's pitching to a full 80% contact here, and this is not Aaron Nola type of stuff. Something is terribly wrong. This is a you know, full nine starts, quarter of the season for Aaron Nola here. He's given up a 190 ISO to the, to the left side and a 170 ISO to the righties. Uh, this is not encouraging at all. It's not so much there in hard contact, but elevated line drives, and the balls are in the air here. 
So I don't want to deal with this and and go after 40% ownership on the, on the mound. If you want to play some leverage stacks from the Cubs, yeah, go ahead. Ian Happ is very playable at 4,200. That's fine. Nico, you can always play him. Uh, he's 49 and expensive, though. Dansby's 44. He's got plenty of pop. Say a Suzuki at 4,000 still. I like this. Matt Mervis, he'll probably be in the five hole at about 2,300 today. So give me give me a little bit of leverage off of this Aaron Nola ownership. I'm, I'm going to come in way under this. Uh, I don't think I, he may be a, a candidate for a, a full-on fade for me today. I think this is totally out of sync with where it should be. Um, I'm not encouraged at all by these underlying metrics here. Uh, something is off with Nola, and until he shows me that I'm wrong uh, and starts to prove otherwise, then I'm not. I'm certainly not paying 40% ownership for the guy. So really, offense only for me here. Um, and I, I like some Cubs, Cubs leverage stacks, but mostly just an Aaron Nola fade. I don't really want to full-on stack Philly, but I think I think that's a, a much better uh, play than Aaron Nola on the mound, for example. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Washington. Alex Fiedo on the mound for the Tigers. I don't think you can play this. Um, now, Fiedo generally pitches to too much contact, and he's only got three pitches here. And I don't really want to do this with um, against against Washington. They don't strike out a whole hell of a lot. Just a 20% aggregate K rate. They're not overwhelming at all in creation. Just an 80 WRC plus and a 105 ISO. No hard contact. No walk rate. So many ground balls here, so that's fine if you generally want to target the Nationals just because they're bad. But they're gonna they're gonna make some contact, and Fajardo is gonna pitch to a lot of contact here. Full 80% so far this year, and as I mentioned, just the three pitches, not getting any swing and miss to the right side with the slider here. And if you've only got a four seamer change, you're a bullpen arm, uh, and you're not even a bullpen arm at that at this level. So. Um, no thank you for Alex Fajardo. Even at a attractive 6,100, um, I think you could play some national stacks here, and they're going to pop in value because they're all still super, super cheap. Luis Garcia, I like this at second base, 3,600. It's a pretty damn good play. Jamer at 31, I think that's an okay play as well. And it's 75 degrees in, in D.C. today. Now, we might have to deal with some weather here. Got to keep an eye on that. But the baseball flies when it's warm. And if they've got some some storms that are sucking up some of the moisture out of the air, then uh, baseball may really fly. And like I said, Alex Fajardo is going to pitch to a good bit of contact here. Um, so I think you could play all these guys. Joey Manessa back from the paternity list. He's at 2700 here. Very playable price. As is Corey Dickerson, healthy again, 2400 for him. He has always hit his entire career. I think this is a pretty viable tournament stack to get some to some nationals, um, even though they don't hit for a lot of power, I think it's okay to get to some shorter stacks is how I'd probably prefer to play it because they don't hit the ball over the wall, but they've got Manessis, they've got Corey Dickerson who has power, right? And they've got Jamer who's shown a little bit as well. So you could play a four man, throw in Luis Garcia or even a Kbert behind the plate. If you want to do that, I think it's viable today when generally it isn't uh, Corbin, Patrick Corbin on the mound for the Nats. 5800 I think this is a playable price. Um, I think I would rather play him than than Braxton Garrett, for example, uh, against Giants. Much rather play Patrick Corbin because I think he's actually figuring it out. The slider here is giving him value this season, and it hasn't in the past. Now, don't get me wrong. He's still pitching to a lot of average here, but the hard contact has basically been reined in here. It's not so out of control where it was 40% in the last couple of seasons. It's still there against righties a little bit because he's not throwing it past them. The and he's still still throwing the two seamer here to right-handers and he cannot do this. Right? He just just throw a cutter for God's sake, throw a cutter. The slider is good again. So throw the pitch that's got a similar grip for the love of baseball, please just throw the cutter. Um in any case, he's not throwing it past anybody, so it's very difficult to play him. But he could he could survive here. He's going a full five and two thirds in every start this season, and he hasn't been nearly as attackable as he has been in the past. He's throwing more strikes. He's not walking people anymore. The chase rate is at thirty percent. This is the threshold we look for. 
The swinging strike stuff is not there, don't get me wrong, but this is not a 22% CSW. It's pushing 26 here, and this is a serviceable number for a guy down here at 5,800 with one good pitch. I think he's figured it out a little bit, and he's still not inducing all the soft contact that you'd like to see, but the value overall from the arsenal is not nearly as bad as it was last season. Look at this ISO number against righties. He's still pitching to the Averns, as I mentioned, but he's not walking them, and he's only given up at 163 ISO. Batted ball-wise in aggregate, yeah, 190x ISO, so you can still attack him because he pitches to so much contact. Full 81.5% here. That's viable to play some of the Tigers here, but you want to play the Tigers as the third most popular team today? I mean, really? Against left-handed pitching, 25% K rate, 87 WRC+, 150 ISO for them. They make a lot of hard contact here, but as I mentioned, is it all that exploitable for against Patrick Corbin anymore? I don't know. The Tigers are, are viable because they're very cheap, and they've got some pieces here that of, of guys that hit left-handed pitching well, notably like a, a Matt Beerling. Torque hits lefties pretty well. Javi Baez historically has hit lefties very well, but he's up to 4,500 now. You want to play that? You want to play Riley Green at 48? Lefty-lefty? I certainly don't. So uh, not my favorite getting to the Tigers today, and of course we've got Weather concerns, as I mentioned, but for the same reason that you could play the Nats due to the you know, lack of moisture in the air and the weather and all that kind of jazz, you could play the Tigers for sure and go after a little bit of Corbin. But I think I'd probably side with Corbin here if I had to choose, not in terms of like raw upside for him, because I think his upside is capped at probably 20 points or so. Um, but who knows? Like... <laughs> 25% aggregate K rate for the Tigers against lefties this season. You could see some outsized performance here for Patrick Corbin if he dials in this sinker a little bit um, and, and gets some value. So he could he could go six innings here, six and two-thirds because they're bad, the Tigers, and, and suppress, strike out five or something like that. I think that's a very reasonable – that's in, within the range of outcomes, and it's very reasonable to expect out of Patrick Corbin today. Um so I think with Detroit getting so much ownership here, I'm kind of off of that. I prefer the national side pretty much all the way around stacks and a little bit of Patrick Corbin. Okay, Oakland and Houston. Let's try and speed this up a little bit. Uh, J.P. Sears on the mound, 6,600. We just can't do this. It's a horrible matchup for him, and he's given bludgeoned by right-handers this season. 222 average allowed is fine. 331 Woba is a little elevated because he's given up a 297 ISO. Is that probably a little noisy? Uh, yeah, maybe, but in a 145-hitter sample, I mean, we're starting to converge here a little bit. He's just on the barrel at a full 11.5% clip. A lot of line drives to the lefties in particular, not so much the righties, but it's mostly in the air. Here it is, an 050 ground ball to fly ball with some hard contact against righties. 2.7 homers per nine, probably a bit noisy, but in aggregate, that's a that's right on the barrel, and he's given up a lot of power, man. A 231 aggregate X ISO is a huge figure. So we can attack this, certainly with Houston. He's throwing a lot of strikes, certainly getting ahead of hitters. And J.P. Sears is a better arm than, like, a Ken Waldachuk or something, and we saw him survive even for five innings last night. So it's very reasonable that Sears could survive here because he's got a better arsenal. But he's still only throwing three pitches, and the bad changeup here is what's really getting him torched by righties. They did get Jose Altuve back, did Houston last night. He's, again, he like he went over five and was just a walk. So he's probably a little cold, needs a little bit of, of time to get back up to game speed here. But everybody else in the lineup, very playable uh, to get here with Houston. They're going to be the second most popular team um, pretty much across the board today to the Yankees. So you could play... Houston again, Alex Bregman at 43, he's still very playable. Jordan at 58, still very playable. Josie Abreu at 25 at a playable price to mix into stacks. Kyle Tucker was the one that hit a, what, a three-run bomb last night, 5,200 for him. 48 for Pena still is not my favorite, so I'd prefer to stay off of that, go to other shortstops on the day. But um, if you're mixing in a bunch of Houston stacks, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's fine to play him, he's still got plenty of pop. But he's overpriced. Don't get me that. Uh, don't get me wrong there. So not my favorite to be fully stacking Houston here. Uh, I do respect J.P. Sears a little bit, but he's got significant problems too. The 
right-handers in particular. It does have a little bit of swing and miss, so that's how he could survive. So if you want to get off of some of the high ownership on Houston, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Uh, but I, I definitely still side with Houston here, and I'll, I'll have some. I'm not sure it's going to be the full, whatever, 12%, 13% in aggregate that they're showing in ownership right now. Uh, I will have a, a ton of Hunter Brown, however, at 9,600. It is a fantastic matchup for him. He's got a little bit of vulnerability here um, in the in the early going. Eight starts, but I, I like I played this guy against Tampa. Don't get me wrong. So I'm absolutely going to be playing him against Oakland here because they're bad. We saw what uh, Brandon Belak did to them last night. Struck out nine in five innings. So and Hunter Brown has got uh, far better aggregate whiff stuff than Belak does. If he, if he's susceptible at all, it's just raw contact to the right side. He's got a little bit of a, a walk rate to the lefties. So if you want to get to some Oakland stacks, I think that's okay once again because they're still super cheap. Uh, very low probability and much lower probability than yesterday, I would say. Um, but everything here from Hunter Brown is is mostly pretty damn encouraging because the ground ball rate is so high. He's got strikeout stuff, and he's got a high ground ball rate. Even if he gives up a little bit of hard contact, it's not really notable or worrisome really it's right around 30 percent it's all on the ground so we don't care about that it's the line drives that are really making him pretty vulnerable here and with a high average allowed to the right side of the plate with a high woba 356 to the righties and a high line drive rate that's how he can get picked apart here a little bit and Oakland is a little bit sticky. Now, they're they're bad. Don't get me wrong. 89 WRC plus, 26% K rate. They're going to walk a little bit. So this could... Um, you could see a little bit of, of of spraying, so to speak, uh, from Hunter Brown here with the 14% walk rate to the lefties. They'll platoon a little bit, but their best hitters are going to be in the lineup like an Asteri Ruiz, Brent Rooker, from the right side of the plate. So... Um, they're not going to hit for a lot of power here, so it's going to make them hard to get there with in full stacks, of course. But if you want to take a, a Ryan Noda or something, he's fine, 2,700. That's okay. Uh, or if you want to play Brent Rooker, he's still got plenty of pop against the right side as well. 3,500 for Asturi Ruiz at the top of the lineup. Still going to steal more bases every time he gets on. So uh, it's okay if you want to play a couple of very short stacks against uh, Hunter Brown here. But I'm siding with him mostly, and I would... In, in addition to Mitch Keller, I'd much rather play Hunter Brown than Aaron Nola, to be quite honest. I think the arsenal is far better. Four-seamer slider, curveball mix, keeping him way down in the strike zone. He needs to develop at this change to get more swing and miss against the lefties, but uh, everything is, is fine so far. I wish he would get a little bit more chase and throw the curveball in the slider for fewer strikes, right, rather than uh, the number that he throws him to for now, but everything is, is okay and it's encouraging, and I think there's a lot of upside, even at this price tag, 9600 for him in this particular matchup. So give me Hunter Brown and some Houston, um, but I, I think it's okay if you want to come off of some of the Houston hitter ownership. Not a problem. Okay, Yankees and the Reds, uh, here's where all the ownership's going to come. Yankees going to be mega popular today against Luke Weaver. And this is also kind of curious that he's popping so hard in the projection, too, at an elevated price tag. I don't know what we're doing there. Um, by at least my account, it's going to be Johnny Brito. Uh, that's where they are in the rotation for the Yankees today. He came in behind an opener uh, in his last outing. They'll likely do that again today. I don't believe they have um, fully announced him yet. Uh, I haven't checked since early this morning when I started doing my initial research on it. Let's do a little a quick refresh. And they still have not announced a, uh, a starter. So they're probably going to do the opener shenanigans again, and it'll likely be Johnny Brito uh, as it was um, in his last start. He was fine doing that. He'll probably get two turns through the lineup here uh, against Reds. Um, do I want to do that? Like, I don't want to play him, number one. Like, he's only going to go four innings or whatever, so he can't really do that. But he's still getting blasted by right-handers, and that's why we couldn't play him in his last start. That's why they've taken him out of the rotation, uh, at least in a, a starter capacity. 381 Woba, 282 average allowed with a 295 ISO. Hard contact north of 30%. Just a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball. You need this a lot higher if you're going to stomach this kind of hard contact. Hard contact though to lefties as well. 
it hasn't quite translated into raw power just yet, but the average is still there with a 272 XBA, 372 X Woba, and a 244 X ISO in aggregate, which is a 15% strikeout rate. So he's not playable on the mound. And you can play some Reds. The problem is they're super expensive. You're gonna play Johnny Indy at 6,000. What are we doing with this price tag with him? Uh, Jake Fraley is at 48. I'll pay that for him, sure. And the price tags on Tyler Stevenson and Nick Senzel, these are still like Coors price tag. I don't know what we're doing here. Um, 47 and 4,900 for those guys respectively. So hard to get to because they're very expensive over here. It's going to make them a super contrarian stack. And there's upside targeting Johnny Brito here. If you want to play the other side of the game of a very popular offense here with the Yankees, they're going to be 15% or more, pretty much every one of them. So you're going to have to balance the ownership if you want to play the Yankees against Luke Weaver. I think he's overpriced here, and I'm really kind of confused about a 13-point median projection for Luke Weaver. Could he pop for this? Yeah, of course. Could he pop for 19? Yeah, sure. But could he also give up five runs in two and a third and, and get yanked? Uh, yeah, I think that's well within range as well, because the early figures on him in power suppression are not great. 227 X ISO with a 333 X Wobe and a 243 X BA. That's a good number, but um, not so much in the power department. Just a 22.5% aggregate strikeout rate so far. He's been good against righties. He's got a 27, 28% K rate there, but he's on the barrel, man. 13% barrel rate so far. And a lot of contact, pitching to 64% strike one, not walking people, so he's just throwing it right over the middle of the plate and getting blasted with hard contact. 41.5% to the lefties, 46.5% to righties, with a lot of really, really loud barrel contact here. That's in the air, 095 aggregate ground ball to fly ball, and it's to both sides of the plate. Uh, not so much in line drive, so it's either going to be on the ground here or it's going to be in the air. And if it's in the air, it's likely to go over the wall. Because you got Judge, who's hit five jacks in the last three days, four days or something. Uh, he's really heating up, and you got to play him pretty much every day. He's going to be 30 or 40% owned in, in a lot of stuff today, so you got to balance that. You could fade it, sure, but like do so at your own risk. Because he's at a playable 6,200. His price should be 66 or 6,700 at the very least when he's this hot. Everybody else is super cheap. DJ at 3600, he is underpriced. Jake Bowers is still 2000. Harrison Bader at 3600, he is underpriced as well. Anthony Volpe down to 3800, probably not underpriced. I think that's probably about value for him. Um, maybe a little high, but Glaber at 47, he's probably underpriced for this particular spot. And Anthony Rizzo at 47, probably underpriced for this particular spot because Luke Weaver's given up so much power to both sides of the plate. I don't want anything to do with this price tag or this median projection. Um, you know, if you if you want to just like gamble that he's he's on the ground and the plus side of the variance here and striking out a lot of these righties, then yeah, go ahead. But I think your upside is probably about five five and a third here, and and maybe like five Ks. That could be enough to take you off some of the Yankees and the very high ownership. I think that's reasonable to um, to go after, but. I don't know. I, I think you just have to side with New York here. I mean, this is a great American, 75 degrees there, and this is a small ballpark. So Weaver's going to pitch you a lot of contact, and it's going to be a lot of hard barrel contact here, and that's not a recipe for success against a very dangerous lineup over here. He just doesn't have the raw whiff stuff against both sides of the plate to allow him to survive that long. Judge will strike out, of course, right? But he's going to hit for all the power in the world, and Glaber's not really going to strike out a lot. DJ's not going to really strike out a lot. Bader will, but he's 3,600. He's got a hell of a lot of pop here. This is a very high upside spot for this entire lineup, which is why we're seeing so much ownership come in to them. So uh, you got to get different with it. Uh, maybe play a Ben Rorfett down at the bottom of the of the lineup uh, behind the plate. He's 2K flat. Um, or like an Aussie Cabrera, but all these guys, because they're cheap, they're also going to see ownership, and we want to get to the Yankees, and we want to get to the expensive arms on the mound, so it's going to be very hard to manage this ownership today. Um, you just have to see how it how it shakes out when you start, start building your teams, but like there's nothing bad I can really say or, or take a stand against fading the Yankees or anything. Um, like I said, the, the only way that you could conceive that it happens is like there's no line drive right here for for Luke Weaver so far. 
it could be just a lot of very hard contact, and it could just be on the ground here. And if they go very right-handed heavy, then I think Luke Weaver could suppress some of this contact, and you could counter-trade the market by just fading the Yankees here. I think that's viable, but you got to see what they want to do with the lineup uh, before you start making those kinds of decisions. Um, I think he's overpriced, though, so I, I don't think you could play him on the mound unless they run out a full eight righties or something. Um, and in that case, I, I mean, that seems pretty unlikely. So um, very hard game to get right here. You're just going to have to balance ownership and get contrarian with some of your other hitters. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Milwaukee and Tampa. I think you could get contrarian here with Tampa Bay and go after some Eric Lauer. He's 8,000 on the mound. I think he's overpriced. Uh, he should be 6,500 here, I think. Uh, he's been dreadful this season against right-handers. He's got some of the the upside against lefties still because he's always been okay there. Um, but he's he's just getting blasted still. They had to move him to the bullpen for a start or two because they can't get him right. 12.5% barrel rate's a monster figure. 10.5% walk rate, too. The chase is totally gone, and he's given up a 44% aggregate hard contact rate to the right side with a sub-10% soft contact. Um, 283 ISO with a 220 aggregate X ISO to both sides of the plate. No thanks, man. 282 XBA with a 371 X Woba. North a 10% aggregate walk rate, as we mentioned, and a lot of fly balls here to both sides. There's this line drive rate against righties is 27.5%. That's a higher line drive rate than a ground ball rate. And that is like, you very rarely see this. So something's totally off with Eric Lauer. I don't think you can play him. And I think you should be getting to some Tampa for sure. They're expensive and kind of hard to stack sometimes, but you can play all of them. Doesn't really matter. All of the lefties hit lefties fine. And they're probably not going to be a lot of them in the lineup anyway. Randy at 55. It's probably my favorite uh, play here today for the combination of power and speed. He'll steal bases, and with a lefty on the mound, he'll steal third base too. Uh, Isak Paredes at third base, I think is a really good play here, 3,500 today. I think that's very strong. You can play Christian Bethencourt behind the plate at 37. He's kind of expensive, not my favorite there, but you can play Babe Siri in the outfield, 2,800. He's been excellent. Um, Manny Margot is also very cheap. They usually stick him in the in the middle of the lineup for some asinine reason but he's 2200 he'll make getting to a Wander Franco at 57 and a Randy up top a little bit cheaper I have to see if Yandi is back today uh they'll lead him off if he is back if not it'll probably be like a Harold Ramirez he's 4,000 you could play him so I think getting to Tampa as kind of a middling and off the board stack here they're popping higher in value than they than their ownership so far so I think this is very viable to get to some Tampa this is still the best team in baseball so um you want to go after Eric Lauer like the homer rate is six percent six percent of his at-bats are going over the wall like or the plate appearances over the wall like that's it's totally crazy so uh way too much susceptibility here for Eric Lauer to be playing him on the mound I I think Tampa's very high upside here today Zach Eflin uh yeah yeah man I don't know what we're doing with this price tag. I think he's overpriced. Um, now, the results this year have been pretty up and down. <sighs> Is this particular spot warranted for a, a higher price tag in general? Uh, yeah, probably, because Brewers are you know, just average. They're better against righties than they are against lefties. But Zach Eflin's not an, all that above-average right-hander, to be quite honest. Um, he's displayed some, some K stuff this year, yeah. That's why the price tag is so high and why the median projection is popping so hard. I think this is fine. Um, he's probably going to miss the cut outside of correlated stacks for me because there's three or even four other guys that I want to play in this range. At 10000 I think he's just overpriced. I think the median projection is probably a little bit too high for the upside that he generally offers. This particular matchup for him is good, though, like I said. And I think it's fine to get to Eflin if you want to um, if you want to kind of differentiate a little bit. He'll be kind of forgotten about given all of the other arms that we have access to. 23%, 23%, easy for me to say, aggregate strikeout rate against righties for the Brewers, 99 over ERC+. Plus, not really encouraging in any sort of metric. There's some hard contact, but it's mostly on the ground. Sub 20%, 
line drive rate is really not all that encouraging. High homer to fly ball rate, so they're going to hit it over the wall when they when they do get it in the air. So that's good. And they're going to walk a little bit. So they tend toward some three true outcome type of stuff here with walks, Ks, and some power. Um, but overall, they just don't create at a, a at an impressive or above average clip, just a 150 ISO and a 320 Woba. So I think it's a fine spot for Eflin. Uh, Two-seamer has been really good. Cutter has been serviceable. It's fine. And he's throwing these two pitches 65% of the time. The curveball has been okay, and that's allowed him to survive. He's throwing some other junk here, which he should probably just get rid of. A lot of chase here, and that's really allowed him to spike the, the K rate uh, really, really high. Um, but he's given up some pop to the left side of the plate. So if you want to get to a Christian Yelich who's so, shown some more power resurges this season, that's fine. Jesse Winker, I'd probably stay off. He stinks, and he gets pinch hit for when they bring in a lefty later on in the game. Uh, Rowdy Telez, I think, is the my favorite lefty play here at 4,300. He didn't strike out a lot, and he's got a lot of pop from the, the left side, of course. Bryce Terang is also a playable 2,400 if you want to get there. Probably staying off of the right-handers here, which makes Zach Eflin, I think, very playable because they're going to, they're going to platoon, um, you know, with a lot of righties here. So they don't have a whole bunch of lefties. They've got a couple, and it would just be those couple that I mentioned. So um, I think Leffin's okay, and for me today, I'm kind of anticipating that he'll miss the cut outside of correlated stacks because um, I think the price tag is just too high, and there's other guys I'd, I'd rather play. But uh, I think it's it's fine, and it's certainly a, a high upside spot. But the ownership... If, if this were 10%, I'd be excited to get about 20%. But at 20%, eh, I'm just kind of lukewarm on it. Uh, but pretty much exclusively just Tampa Bay here. No Eric Lauer, maybe a Rowdy or Bryce Terang, something like that. Uh, okay, last game of the day here. Like I said, we got some weather here, and this game's probably going to get washed out. Um, it looks pretty bad so far, so keep an eye on this. Uh, Max Scherzer is one of these guys up here that I may consider, but probably not, uh, given the weather. And I'm not totally convinced that Scherzer is fully healthy here. I'm not sure if it's a neck or the back or the oblique or if he's going to cheat and with, you know, or whatever he's going to do here. Um, I'm not convinced Scherzer is fully right yet. He hasn't been able to get into a rhythm. And when I'm paying over 10,000 for a guy, I need seven inning. I need high confidence that he's going to go six and I need at least seven inning upside. And he hasn't shown any of that this season. Uh, he's got six starts here. So, um, yeah, he got he got booted in one of them, and he had to come out in a couple others or whatever. So, I don't know, man. It, it feels a little fishy here with Scherzer. Um, it's Scherzer, and he can pick through Cleveland because this team is bad. But I don't know, man. Like, I'll probably just going to stay off. Like I said, we got weather here. I'm not super interested in it um, really at all. I don't want to play the Mets either. Even if the game does play and there were no weather concerns, I don't want to play the Mets against Tanner Bybee either. 8,900, I really respect this arm here. There's so much upside for him. Um, really not a lot of susceptibility so far. He's a, he's a fly ball pitcher, and those guys are really hard to stack against with teams that don't hit the baseball over the wall. They, now, Pete Alonzo has hit Jackson, I think, Four straight days or something like that. 5200 for him. That's a very playable price tag. Frankie Lindor against his old team. 4600 Yeah, you can play him. Um, everybody else, though, I think just kind of stinks. Not a lot of raw upside for Brandon Nimmo. 44 is a little bit better than the 47 in the last couple of days you've had to pay for him. Jeff McNeil, just contact hitter. Brett Beatty, also kind of just contact hitter so far. And you want to play like a Mark Vientos? I mean, I, I don't particularly. Frankie Alvarez behind the plate? Eh. So I'd rather play Bybee as opposed to Scherzer if I had to choose between the two. But the strikeout matchups for both of these guys are terrible. So no thank you. 20% uh, aggregate K rate for the Mets against righties this season and a 20% K rate for the Guardians against righties this season. Both of them creating at an average or well below average clip, not hitting for enough power or hard contact. So... Uh, I'm not interested in offense, not really interested in pitching because of the weather, so no thanks. Just kind of a write-off for me. If the game does play, um, I hope hope that just nobody goes off, I guess. Uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of where I am. So I think there's plenty of other spots to get to outside of this game. All right, that's it. Uh, let's wrap it up here and get to some stacks. Um, I want a lot of Mitch Keller. Probably no offense in this game. Maybe a little Brandon Fott, too. But I, I think Pittsburgh is maybe breaking out of this 
real cold slump that they've been in. And Brandon Fott's been very vulnerable to start his big league career. So if you want to play some off super off the board Pittsburgh sacks, I think that's okay. They're middling in value and way down the board in ownership so far. So super off the board. It's okay. Um, Miami and San Francisco, give me the Giants here. I think this is an attackable spot in a day game with some wind blowing out against Braxton Garrett. He gives up a lot of power to the right side. Logan Webb's good, too, at ni- at uh, 10-6, rather. Um, I think it's very playable price tag for him in a pretty damn good matchup. He's been very consistent. Kind of worried. I don't know. Not worried. Um, I'm just like, eh, about the, the ownership here at 35% or whatever. But uh, he, he's very playable. Colorado and Texas. Um, John Gray, yeah, sure. You could play a couple of lefty pieces on the other side against him, though. Uh, probably not going to full stack against John Gray, but... Um, it is a way off the board stack. It probably should be, I think. But uh, you can play some Texas too against Kyle Freeland. When he's bad, he floats the two seamer, uh, and it it goes over the wall. So um, you can play Texas, but I'm kind of off of them because Kyle Freeland his fastball mix has been pretty damn good this season. Cubs in Philly, I think you can play a little bit of the Cubs in in leverage stacks. They're cheap enough to make this happen. And Aaron Nola, like he's pitching to way too much contact. Something's wrong with him. I'm not eating 40% ownership on the guy. It's just not happening for me. Uh, Jamison tied on, uh, on the other side. I'm not playing him either. I do like some Philly here as well. So give me some offense. I think baseball could fly in this game. Detroit and Washington. I'm not sure the baseball is going to fly in this game. It could for sure. We got a little bit of weather to keep an eye on. Definitely, but I like Patrick Corbin here a little bit to suppress some contact, uh, at least suppress some production from Detroit. So I'm kind of off of Detroit, even though they're attractive, and this is Patrick Corbin, who's historically been bad, uh, at least the past couple of years. I think he's figured it out a little bit. Uh, No Alex Fajardo for me. Definitely some Washington I like, though. Oakland and Houston, probably no Oakland today for me. Um, And we're just going to go right back to Houston against J.P. Sears, he pitches to a lot of contact to the right side as well. Better arm than Waldachuk, but, um, you know, and he could suppress for sure. And you could come off Houston because of that. I think that's fine, but a lot of Hunter Brown, definitely. Yankees and Cincinnati, you just got to balance, balance ownership with the Yankees here. Uh, no pitching here for me, uh, unless the Yankees come out with a fully right-handed heavy lineup, then that would maybe put Luke Weaver in play uh, as a super leverage play on the mound, but, man, that's pretty dangerous you can play the reds if you want to go after johnny burrito they're expensive though milwaukee and tampa no milwaukee for me just tampa here i like tampa a lot and maybe i'm coming on to eflin a little bit more than 10 minutes ago i guess i think that's okay um but i i really like tampa i think it's a very good leverage stack here uh against the field cleveland and the mets probably just gonna write this game off personally i think it's gonna get washed out So that's it. Uh, Keep an eye once again for projections and ownership updates. Things will change in the next couple of hours. Um, I promise you that. So good luck to everybody here on the Saturday early if you are punting.